in the Word of God in our present Sunday morning series of studies in the Old Testament in the book of Psalms, Psalm number 36. A short psalm and in many ways a very sweet and wonderful psalm. Psalm number 36, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord. Now I'm reading from the Revised Standard Version, which begins, Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. The New International Version reads, An oracle or a burden is in my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. I would tend to read it, Transgression rings a bell with the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. The words of his mouth are mischief and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and do good he plots mischief while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. And his whole attitude to life is negative because he spurns not evil. And the psalmist pauses and then says, Thy steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Thy faith fullness to the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the mountains of God. Thy judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast, thou savest, O Lord. How precious is thy steadfast love, O God. The children of men take refuge in the shadow of thy wings. They feast on the abundance of thy house, and thou givest them drink from the river of thy delights. <laughs> this is obviously a man who enjoys God. For with thee, verse 9, is the fountain of life. In thy light do we see light. O oh, continue thy steadfast love to those who know thee, and thy salvation to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the evildoers lie prostrate. They are thrust down, unable to rise. Amen, and may God bless to our hearts such a reading of his word. I've got a picture in my house. It's an oil painting. It was given to me. I'm not in the league for buying oil paintings. But that picture, you can look at it and think that it is very dark and very dull and really quite a depressing picture. But when the little table lamp is lit below the picture and you look at the picture from a certain angle, you begin to see all sorts of fascinating colors and tones and perspective and every time I look at it when the light is on I am glad indeed to have that picture and I can look at it again and again and again and I keep on seeing all sorts of aspects of it that give me pleasure and I mention this only by way of illustration of how we should approach Psalm number 36. Because David, as it were, is looking at a picture of life. A picture of the world, if you like. A picture of society. And in verses 1 to 4 of the psalm, all that he sees is the wickedness of the wicked. And that makes it really a very depressing picture. 
And uh, David in the first four verses of the psalm seems preoccupied with evil people and with their evil deeds, which evil deeds they seem to take such perverse delight in doing. But then in verses 5 to 12 of the psalm, he, he takes something of a different standpoint. He looks from a different angle. And the picture he sees in the second half of the psalm is a picture that is full of magnificent color because it is a picture of the goodness of God. A picture, if you like, of the good love of God. And it is a picture that thrills him and excites him and encourages him just as the picture in the first four verses of the psalm tended to depress him. But I'm, I'm slightly wrong in saying that the picture of the wicked depresses David, because I don't think ultimately it does. It is simply that looking at the world and society and life from the standpoint of faith in God... David is realistic. He doesn't pretend that everything in the garden is lovely. And if you read your daily papers, you can't pretend either that everything in the garden of the world is lovely. David's religion, if you like, I don't like the word religion, David's, David's faith in God is not in any sense sentimental because he knows God and believes in God his eyes are wide open and he sees things as they really are and here in Psalm 36 as I say he sees two pictures two pictures of two very different ways of life in verses 1 to 4, he, paid, he gives for us the picture of men and women turned in upon themselves. There is no fear of God before their eyes. They are turned in upon themselves. And that causes them to live life in a particular kind of way. The second picture in verses 5 to 12 is the picture of a man or a woman. In David's case, he's speaking personally. The picture of a man with his heart fixed upon God. A heart trusting in God. And this leads that man to fullness of life. And the psalm testifies and teaches, and I'm referring to verse 9 that it is in the light of God and only in God's light that we can see clearly. People who are unbelievers can't see clearly. People who leave God out of their thinking and their reckoning can neither see clearly nor bring the facts of life into authentic focus. And people who leave God out of their reckoning will always be basically defective in their understanding of their own life, and of the life of society, and the life of the world. And so with that kind of introduction, we turn to the first four verses of the psalm in which the psalmist describes the wicked, and does so with great realism and a very accurate diagnosis. And he really says that these people flatter themselves in their own eyes. These are people who believe in themselves. And you may say, oh, I know a lot of people like that. So do I. There may very well be some like that here in church this morning. 
who believe in themselves. But as I said when I read the psalm, this opening verse in the the Revised Standard Version reads, Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. These four verses speak of people who are dedicated to sin. Now that's, that's quite a vivid picture, isn't it? Transgression in its various forms, sometimes refined, sometimes gross, transgression in its various forms attracts this man. It fascinates this man. This man goes to transgression as a moth will go to a burning light. Oh, you say, it is a fatal attraction. Oh, yes. Because Scripture in the New Testament and the Epistle of James says that sin, when it is finished, when it has done all the other disintegrating and disastrous and diabolical things to human personality and human life and human society, sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Yes, it is a fatal attraction. But this man, you see, this wicked man, finds that transgression, sin, wrong, that that which people would frown upon, that which is forbidden by law. He finds that all these things ring a bell deep in his heart. He hears about something in his immediate life. Oh, I would like to go. Transgression rings a bell deep in the heart of this man and transgression finds a response of interest. And the first verse adds the comment, there is no fear of God before his eye. But then you see, sensible people would take the attitude that if God frowns on something, it is best not to get involved. But for this man it says, there is no fear of God before his eyes. Now the Psalms speak of this kind of thing in a variety of different ways. In a way back in Psalm number 10 at verse 4, it says in the RSV, all his his thoughts are, there is no God. The New International Version translates it, eh, in his thoughts there is no room for God. The old authorized version describes this man saying, God is not in all his thoughts. God just never crosses his mind. This this kind of man, you see, could never say and would never say that he's against God. It's just that he never thinks about God. God. All the different things that go through his mind in the course of one week, if you examine the whole train of that thought, you would see not a single indication of or reference to God. God is not in all his thoughts. There may be people here this morning who could say, well, to be quite honest, since I was in church last Sunday, I haven't thought once about God. Oh, you better look to yourself. That's that's not a good condition to be in. And I turn over then to Psalm number 14, the very first verse. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. He says it in his heart, he doesn't necessarily say it to other people, because these other people may believe in God, and they may argue with him, and he doesn't like arguing about religion. So the fool says in his heart, there is no God. 
and he lives accordingly. But, what if there is a God? People have said this to me. They say, I, I, I don't believe there's a God. And I have to say, well, but supposing there is a God, and you have left him totally and completely out of your thinking, out of your reckoning, and out of your life, will it not be a rather disastrous predicament for you at the end of the day? When you will stand before God's judgment and it's no use saying, oh, oh, but God, I don't believe yet that you exist. The answer to that, well, that's too bad. I am. There are those. There are those nowadays. And I've heard it said. There are those nowadays who say, "Oh, I, I just don't believe all these stories about the concentration camps in Nazi Germany." But you see, these were fact. But the fool says in his heart, "There is no God." And when we come to Psalm number thirty-six. There is no fear of God before his eyes. Now this man in Psalm 36 could say, I do believe in God, but I have no intention of taking God seriously because that would interfere with the way that I want to live my life. Some of you who know your Bibles will know the story of how Moses was sent to the Pharaoh of Egypt uh, with the message from God, let my people go. And at one point, Pharaoh's response was, oh, a response of total arrogance. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? There was no fear of God before his eyes. Now David goes on in the four verses, the first four verses of this psalm to show the result of this. And the result is a way of life in which transgression is the main motivation of the man's life. Transgression rings a bell deep in his heart. Over against that, in my own thinking, as I prepared for this service, I put the words from Psalm number 16 that I very, very often read at a wedding, reading them to the, speaking of them to the bride and the groom just as soon as they are married, indicating to them the way of life. And in Psalm 16, verse 8, the psalmist says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad. But this man here, there is no fear of God before his eyes. And in the New Testament, in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3, when Paul was describing the nature of sin, using a whole lot of different scriptures, he took this verse from Psalm number 36, almost at the end of the list, as it were, summing up the nature, the attitude, and the disposition of sin. There is no fear of God before his eyes. And when there is no fear of God before people's eyes, and no thoughts of God in their thinking, this is what happens to the individual and to society. And I'm reading some of the verses from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 1, at verse 21. Although they knew God, they did not <clears throat> honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for him as images resembling man. They, they thought of God like man. And then they thought of God like birds. 
or like animals or like reptiles. They're having left God out of their thinking. There being no fear of God. They gradually in their own thinking degraded the concept of God. Therefore, as a consequence, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error. They were filled with all manner of wickedness and evil and covetousness, malice, envy. Oh, you say, preacher, you could be reading the daily papers. Yes. And when you read in this coming week some of the things that you will read in the papers, you go back in your thinking to this verse of Psalm 36. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And when that happens, not only do individuals degenerate, the whole of society degenerates. And when there is no fear of God, there is no sense of sin, and there is no belief in judgment. In verse 2, the, the psalm says, this evil man flatters himself in his own eyes. He says, oh, I'm, I'm as good as the next man. He could equally well say, oh, I'm as bad as the next man. But he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. He flatters himself, oh, I've, I've, I've never done anything particularly bad. Except that I have by deliberate choice ignored God and kept him out of my life. And verse 3 is, indicates the influence of thought and life that exclude God. If you are like that, you're bad for people. The words of his mouth are mischief. You know, doing good, mischief and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and to do good. Because by, by the way that you live with no fear of God and God excluded from your life, you are influencing others to turn away from God. Verse 4, he plots mischief. The way of life that he chooses is not good. And he becomes tolerant of evil because he doesn't really see it as evil. He spurns not evil. He, he reads about things. He sees things on television. He says, oh, well, the, these are the things that people do. But God says these things are evil. But this man spurns not evil. In verses 3 and 4, it's really all negative. He, he has ceased. He doesn't do good. He spurns not evil. This is the man without God. There is no fear of God before his eyes. And then David looks at the other picture in verses 5 to 12. And what does he see? The steadfast love of God. Love that you can count on. And his whole mind and heart are gripped by what the New Testament would describe in Ephesians chapter 3 as the length and the breadth and the depth and the height of the love of God that passes knowledge. I confess that I felt like a little child and I was quite happy to do the actions for wide, oh, because you see it's true, wide, wide as the ocean, high as the heavens above, deep, deep as the deepest sea is my Saviour's love. I, though so unworthy, still am a child of his care, for his word teaches me 
that his love reaches me everywhere. The steadfast love, thy steadfast love, O Lord, ex- extends to the heaven. Now you see, in the first picture, it was wickedness that rang a bell in the man's heart. In the second half of the psalm, it's the love of God that rings a bell. Oh, what a peal of bells in this man's heart. And this directs the whole of his life. And it is the, it is the expansiveness of God's love and the life that it brings that he speaks of. And he speaks poetically. Because prose is not good enough. This is why people in love write love letters and write poetry in their love letters. Because ordinary language is just, is just not enough to describe what they are trying to describe. I, I've been thinking a lot about different hymns this week. Maybe we should have sung it this morning. The hymn that has the verse in it, the, the verse in it that says... For the love of God is broader than the measure of man's mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. That's the hymn that begins in our hymn book, Souls of men, why will you scatter from a love so true and deep? And David says, Thy steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, thy faithfulness to the clouds. Oh, speaking about the heavens and the clouds, he, 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 really, he is really speaking about the love of God as being unsearchable. Thy righteousness is like the mountains of God, Oh, impregnable, something that, can, that cannot be moved. <coughs> oh, there are things in the Bible that point out what God cannot do. It, it says in the Bible that God cannot lie. And I'm quite sure the Bible teaches that there's another thing that God cannot do. He cannot be moved from the love that he has covenanted to me. It says in the Bible, Behold, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Unsearchable, impregnable. My judgments are like the great deep. They, they are inexhaustible. Man and beast. Oh, that made me think of Jesus when he said, not even one wee sparrow can fall to the ground. I often look out the kitchen window and watch the wee spugs, the sparrows bouncing around. He knows. What's the chorus that says? He sees the little sparrow fall. Man and beast, thou savest, O Lord. Do you see what he's saying about the wonderful, mighty, majestic love of God? In that love you can feel safe. And comfortable. Sometimes when I've been invited to certain homes, I'm not speaking about the congregation, I think sometimes of posh homes that I've got to go to. And, uh, you know, you're sitting. I'm, I'm not relaxed. But the house of the love of God, oh, I feel safe. I feel Comfortable in God's love. The children of men, verse 7, take refuge in the shadow of thy wings. They feast on the abundance of thy house and thou givest them drink from the river of thy delights. Oh, it's so pleasurable. And the, these are these are words that should lead us almost instinctively to the New Testament and to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ when he said, Oh, how often I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks. It's a lovely picture, isn't it? It's a 
picture of God. As we're trying to say to the children, oh yes, he's great. His love is unsearchable. But oh, the tenderness of his care. They take refuge in the shadow of thy wings. But I've linked up and read by her the word shadow in verse 7 with the word light in verse 9. The shadow of God is not dark. It's light. I quoted from Paul's letter to the Ephesians about the length and breadth and depth and height and the, of the love of God that passes understanding or passes knowledge. Here's me trying to expound the love of God. It's, past. it's no use. Think, think of being on a mountain top on a clear sunny day. There haven't been all very many of that kind of day this summer so far. But on top of a mountain on a clear sunny day with, with vast visibility. And the psalmist is looking out on the, the glories of creation. And he sees the might and the majesty and the power of creation, the, the mountains. He sees the glory of the, of the sky and the clouds. And he can look down and he can, he can see the rivers. And he thinks of God. And he sees all the, all the changing shades of light and color. And he speaks saying, Thy steadfast love, O God, is like the limitless arch of the heavens. People sometimes say to each other, how much do you love me? I'm told that when I was but a toddler, I used to sometimes ask my mother if she loved me a big, big sum or a little, little sum. Well, I knew the answer. But you see, I wanted to be told. And God said, oh, well, I'll tell you. Look, look at the arch of the heavens. That's the measurement of my love for you. Thy faithfulness to the clouds. Perhaps, perhaps he's, <coughs> he's looking up to the sky and seeing the endless succession of the, of the lovely white clouds. Not, not the ones that have ominous significance, but the clouds that speak of beauty. Thy righteousness is like the mountains of God, solid and towering. Thy judgments, God's dealings with the nations, Deep as the sea, man and beast, thou savest, O Lord. What a, what a God to have. What a God to trust. What a God to look to. What, what a God into whose hands to put the whole of your life and all your future. And all those who are dear to you. What, what a God. Remember the man, the man in the first four verses of the psalm wanted to exclude that God from his life. I quite deliberately chose the children's hymn for this morning. God who made the earth, the air, the sky, the sea. Who gave the light its birth cares for me. God who sent his son to die on Calvary, he, if I lean on him, will care for me. And David says in verse 7, how precious is thy steadfast love, O God. O God, what would I do without you? 
Oh God, why are you so good to me? With thee, verse 9, <clears throat> is the fountain of life. As I draw to a close, can I remind you of Jesus' words? In the story of the woman at the well of Samaria, remember she came to the well when nobody else was there because she was a, she was a society reject. And she met Jesus. And he asked her for a drink of water. And he spoke about water. And Jesus showed her the well and said, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give shall not never thirst. For the water that I give is the very water of life that will be like a spring of fresh water welling up within you. And in John chapter 7, on a certain occasion, Jesus stood up in the crowd. He'd been sitting like a Jewish teacher teaching the people, and he stood up. And he spoke the words, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. They feast on the abundance of thy house, and thou givest them drink from the river of thy delight, for with thee is the fountain of life and in thy light shall we see light verse 10 O oh, continue thy steadfast love can we paraphrase it what's the man saying he's saying O oh God don't stop loving me oh, I would say amen to that Oh, continue thy steadfast love. Don't stop loving me. Keep me safe. Continue thy steadfast love to those who know thee and thy salvation to the upright in heart. Ah, oh, but you say, Mr. Philip, there's a shadow in the last two verses. Yes. There are those unmoved by the love of God. There are those who have excluded from their lives not only the love of God, <clears throat> but the very God of love. But the amazing thing about the gospel is this, that men and women who have said no to God, who have excluded him from their thoughts and their lives, such people can be touched afresh by the love of God, and they can change and they can turn. You know, to turn is the word convert. And Jesus said, not the Jesus on the cross, but the Jesus throned in glory. It's recorded in the book of Revelation. Jesus said, and he still says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and stay with him. What does the psalmist say? In the psalm we began the service with, if I remember rightly, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Let's sing that, the hymn that we've chosen to close our service. I nearly intimated the wrong one just now, but we're going to be singing, I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus, but that's at the evening service. We close this morning with hymn number 434, Loved with everlasting love, led by grace that love to know. Hymn number 434.